Welcome back to the show, all of you out there, all of you Brainiacs that are listening. I've got a really great show today. It's actually one I've been excited about for quite a while, and I've been waiting for the publication of the of the document we're going to be discussing. Dr. Jess Wright is joining us. Well, you joined a few uh, weeks ago, maybe it was a couple months ago, actually, to talk about your work with uh, psychological and uh, behavioral therapy assistive technology that you've been researching and working on for quite a while. And uh, today you're here as your author self, the author of A Stream to Follow. And right up top, before we, we start talking about it, I want to say that this is going to be our first official book of the Broken Brain Book Club, and we'll, I'll share some more details about that a little later on of how we're going to do that. But I'm really excited to read along with you listeners as we get to get to know it and have the story unfold as well. So, uh, but first off, Jess, welcome. Welcome back. Well, thanks so much, Dwight. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be the very first book <laughs> on the Broken Brain Book Club. It's so, a pretty uh, distinguished I was the first at something, so... <laughs> Tell us, uh, when does the book release? Have we have we been there yet? Has it yes, it was out? released yeah. last Tuesday. So it's out and about. Uh, you can get it online at any of the online sellers like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of the indies. Or yes. You can have it ordered at your local bookstore if you'd like to. Okay. All right. Good. So, yeah, it's out and active now. You were kind enough to share a copy uh, with me also. We won't have any big – and I don't even know if it's spoilery anyway – uh, so we won't spoil it for anyone or or whatever. Maybe if you want to, we'll have a special time for that. Oh, we'll we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Tell everybody about how did you get into this idea of writing a novel, and um, how would you introduce it to people so they know what it's about? One of the very best questions is why did I do this, and how did I get into it? As a, a professor of psychiatry, and uh, I, I've I've written innumerable scientific papers and uh, chapters and books and authored a multimedia computer program for treatment. But my, my stick really has been uh, cognitive behavior therapy and psychopharmacology, treatment of depression. And here I am out with a novel. So how did I get from point A to point T or whatever it was uh, <laughs> in, in, in this particular project? So I think it's been percolating in me for a long time. I didn't really start out to be a writer by any means. In fact, I think back to my first year of English classes in college, and I would imagine that my English teacher, literature teacher, would be astounded <laughs> to realize that I have published a single thing, let alone having the audacity to try a novel. Uh, but I, I, I'm up for a challenge, and uh, I think I was up for something new. Yeah. I, I've been I've been writing about uh, people struggling with depression. Uh, trauma, PTSD, anxiety, and things like that from a medical point of view and a self-help point of view mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. And I thought it was um, an opportunity. Uh, and it hasn't been done much, by the way, of having a psychiatrist or a psychologist uh, write a novel. I've been doing this a long time. I think I know a lot about the way people suffer and the way they recover. And uh, I thought I had an insight into character and the way people think and feel that um, was worth exploring. The other thing, Dwight, was um, I'm the son of a World War II vet, and uh, my uncle was a World War II vet, and both of them were the so-called soldiers who suffered in silence. They didn't say a word about their experiences. And I knew for sure that my uncle had seen pretty vicious action. He was a Mustang fighter pilot that flew over the channel from England into France and Germany. And uh, that was a very hazardous profession, to say the least. And my dad was a captain in the Pacific, and I knew he saw combat, but he never said a word about it. And he died young. Um, and as I, I, as I put it together later on in life, I thought that the war experiences that he never talked about mm -hmm. had probably played a role in why he didn't hang around as long as he should have. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then my, my uncle, who... He finally spelled it all out to me one afternoon when he was diagnosed with, after he'd been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, and he knew that his days were numbered. And we were sitting in his garden, and I don't know why. I was actually planting some perennials for him. He thought, gee, maybe I could plant the garden, and it would be there for a while for his wife and others, and I did it. Uh, and then it all came out. And so this World War II era novel about people that had suffered trauma, emotional trauma, 
physical trauma or trying to recover, I think was in me. And, um, and so that's a part of why I did it. Is it a way to connect with those individuals, with your father and your uncle? Yeah. You know, as I, as I wrote it, I had a, I had this deep feeling of connectivity to them, even though they're both gone now. Also, do I, I, I'm a, I was a military psychiatrist for a while. I, when I was a medical student, Vietnam was going, you can, that sort of dates me as you can see, but uh, I won't hide the fact that I have a little seasoning. Uh, but I, I, I was a medical student during Vietnam. And during those days, all the guys were subject to the draft and the doctors were drafted like everybody else. So I was, uh, drafted and was able to defer until after, right after Vietnam, I served uh, for a couple of years and I saw a lot of PTSD and, and guys that were, you just come back from the war in Vietnam. We're, uh, we're so calling that, it, that influenced me. Yeah. Yeah. Were we calling it PTSD yet in the Vietnam? Yeah, Vietnam we were. Yeah. Uh, if you go back to other wars, uh, it was called Soldier's Heart. In oh. the Civil War, which I had not known. I did a little research on it uh, for the book, as you might imagine. And, uh, yeah, it was called Soldier's Heart. I guess there was something about one's heart that was not quite uh, with it enough to stay in battle indefinitely. Uh, huh. And then during um, World War One, it was called uh, Shell Shock. Mm-hmm. You might have heard that term. And then Ro- World War Two was I've heard, yeah. Combat Fatigue. And uh, some of you may have seen the movie Patton, where George Patton, the famous general, berates a soldier that's having trouble with, obviously, with PTSD. It's a really traumatic, emotional moment in the movie. And Patton was called down for that. Uh, But during World War II, uh, there was some empathy for what soldiers went through. And it turns out that the frequency of PTSD in wartime is very high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it the makes sense. It's I saw it's defining about, trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Close to 25% will, it will have an acute, uh, will have a, have some elements of PTSD and 10 to 12% will, it'll be ongoing. Yeah. That was um, one of the things yeah. I was curious about. Cause of course the novel takes place, uh, well, uh, following world war two, we have a world war two veteran returning home in the very beginning. And, Right up front, there seems to be an awareness with this person. In fact, there's there was some treatment that the that is is a doctor, the protagonist. When we start out, and um, there seemed to be some awareness, and it got me thinking about what did what did we know as a as a people, as a culture, as a profession? You know, you, as you put it, they're they're talking about shell shocked, and they are. There was some attempt even at medication that is alluded to. So there must have been some yeah. knowledge of the treatment was important. Yeah, there, it's, the treatments evolved tremendously. We can talk about that a bit later. Uh, but during World War II, the most common treatment was a few days of respite. People were taken off the front line. Wow. Uh, they were given a little rest, and it was assumed they were going to go back. Mm-hmm. And the vast majority of them did go back. Some of them got uh, a, a shot of intravenous sodium amytal. You may have heard in old movies of the so-called truth serum. Oh, uh, yes. It's an old seen movie, this, yeah. I think, with Jimmy Darren in it, or one of those characters, in which the truth serum is given, and then all this stuff spills out that was held inside. Uh, and that that there's a, a technical term for that in, in psychiatry and psychology called narcosynthesis. Uh, and it's not done hard. I don't know if any, I have... I have not seen it done. There's no, no legal decades. ethical application now for it, would you say? Well, I don't know. It, it was thought there? to be similar, similar to hypnosis. Oh, oh okay. uh, So you, it, it's like a hypnotic kind of experience where you would talk about things that were buried inside, but it was done under the influence of this powerful sedative, uh, like a barbiturate. And these drugs are, yeah. are hardly used at all anymore in, in modern medicine. Huh. Uh, yeah, so I that, remember uh, uh, seeing... On the way to win. I remember seeing that in, I think it was the Guns of Navarone, that they had to lie to a compatriot that they had to leave behind because he was going to be captured and given uh, a, you know, given a truth serum type of medication. And so oh, we're going north. Just remember we're going north. Don't tell anyone we're going north or something. Right. Um, yeah, now, but, did, that, um, did that stem at all from an understanding that talking about it was healthy? Yes. I think yeah. that, the, that there was some understanding that it was – good to talk about it and not to bury it inside. Uh, and that's a cornerstone of treatment today. 
Now, the culturally, you you already mentioned the suffer in silence value system, uh, stoicism, obviously, and and so that's an interesting contrast with the understanding that hey, you better talk about this, and we don't talk about it. That's right. Even today, I mean, in this enlightened, so-called enlightened yeah. uh, environment that we're in, uh, traumas of all sorts that people have, uh, for one reason or another, they keep quiet about it. Yeah. And uh, it may come out here and there, it comes out in dreams, comes out in flashbacks, comes out in nightmares, uh, comes out in avoidance of trying to protect yourself somehow from the cues of what the trauma might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we see this a lot in clinical practice. And if, if we want to help somebody, typically we have them begin to talk about it and rework it and rework it and rework it until um, it's incorporated in a way that doesn't cause any symptoms. No. Uh, a reason that you went with uh, the medical perspective from a soldier that was also a doctor, I was curious about some of the selection there. Obviously, you're a doctor. Um, yeah. but, uh, I wondered, too, it, it seems like a very effective way to be a gateway to multiple types of trauma. And I'm sure the, a medic's role, very, very traumatic in that war. Right. there. I, I thought that I would write a book about uh, a physician who'd served in the war. And I began to do some reading about it before I even put a word on p- the paper. And I found several books that were very interesting, written by people who were had lived experience, mm-hmm. doctors, nurses, corpsmen that had served in World War II. And I found one book that I would recommend to your readers. Uh, that's I thought it was just a brilliant book, uh, very moving. And it's, uh, it's still in print. You can find it here and there. Uh, not, not in print, but you can get it on back order places. It's called The Other Side of Time by a surgeon named Brendan. Fibs, P H I B B S. And Fibs, his story was a story that I uh, borrowed from a bit. Not, I didn't tell it in any way exactly like he lived it, but his experience was one that I thought was common for physicians during the war. A story that uh, not many people knew about today. And I thought it was a story worth telling. So, what happened during World War II is they took recent medical school graduates. I mean, just fresh, uh, green as could be. And, and and instead of them going through a full residency and fellowship and surgery to be able to be a frontline surgeon, they put them into a crash course. Uh, wow. And the, the people that were sent to the very front lines that were served in so-called battlefield aid stations, they were really in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. And they were the ones that were 24 or 25, just got out of medical school. They had just a short while of learning how to do this uh, pretty aggressive surgery and, and staving off life-threatening wounds. Well, not a very great environment to work in, too, right? Yeah. yeah that, was, that was before we had helicopters to bring people back to the field hospitals. So a lot of the work was done then. Ultimately, if the battle calmed down, they could get an ambulance in and transport somebody back to a, gotcha. a, a, field, a field hospital in the background. But these doctors... Uh, there was no mercy shown by the Germans. Uh, the ambulances with the Red Cross, that was a target practice. I noticed this in the story. I was like, really? I mean, it oh, makes yeah. sense, I guess, but I had never thought about that. Typically, I mean, there's some hands off. You, you, I mean, yeah, I guess you'd hope <laughs> that there would be. And I don't know if you found that in other, I don't, of course, you're, so your own, your own experience contrasts with this too. So I don't know if you find that in other skirmishes sure. or wars, but that was, mm-hmm. that was, Jarring to me to hear that. that yeah, there's, yeah, there's a fire upon them. There's a, a cu- several scenes that are chapters that are like flashbacks where the main character, Bruce Duncan, who's a surgeon, uh, is taken back in time to what he experienced during the war. And one of those was uh, during the Battle of Herlesheim, which actually occurred. It was in Alsace, that area that has gone back and forth between Germany and France. And it's right on the uh, on the river where where they were crossing the Rhine to invade Germany, and the Germans were holding on for everything. It was during the last winter of the war, the same time as the Battle of the Bulge, which gets a lot of people know a lot about the Battle of the Bulge. But the the battles in Alsace were equally bloody and equally pivotal, and uh, Fib served in that. So I learned a bit about that battle. I even visited the, the town of Herlesheim and uh, a town called Rottweiler. 
where um, the surgical hospital was, and it got decimated. Uh, in fact, I, I have a short passage that I could read that would give a flavor of that. Would that be okay? Please, yeah. Wait, yeah, wait just one second. I just have to go pull the book from my bookshelf and I'll of course. read that passage. This is a scene that's partway through the book when uh, Bruce Duncan, who's now trying to regroup his life in a small town in Pennsylvania as a general practitioner, and he's having his struggles with PTSD uh, and other things. On a personal level, I appreciated uh, the references to small town Pennsylvania. I grew up in Harrisburg. And so I actually was like, oh, he's he, the train station in Altoona. I know where Altoona is. No, who knows right. where Altoona is? But sure. I <laughs> yeah, I tried to give it some authenticity of what a small town was like then. I happened to have grown up in that area, so I knew it pretty well. Uh, but this is a story about this particular chapter is about uh, this battle. And the Germans are closing in on this small town named Rohrwiller in this Battle of Herlesheim. And they've, uh, they've shelled the, the battlefield aid station and the, the uh, doctors, the two surgeons there, um, Bruce Duncan and his friend Blaze. And uh, their colonel has just come in and said that um, there's no way that they can evacuate the, the men that are there in the hospital. Uh, there's no way they can evacuate the Germans they've captured that are injured, that they've treated, and they're going to have to defend it as best they can. And they deliver some machine guns and bazookas to the doctors. And I was imagining myself with a bazooka on my shoulder trying to stave <laughs> they off. A they, fight. Didn't get, they didn't issue like you those in, in uh, yeah, Vietnam? <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm going to just read a, a couple uh, paragraphs from it. Wonderful. Yeah. The soldier who had his genitals shot off was resting now. His stump was packed with gauze and sulfur. The GI who had his brain ripped apart was barely breathing. Chokes and rattles told the story that he wouldn't see another day. The wounded Germans were in the corner of the room, handcuffed to cots if they were conscious. One of them had beady eyes, which he hadn't closed all night. Bruce worried about him. Could he spring on them, try to grab their guns? wipe them out and fight his way back to his troops. His thoughts were interrupted by a sudden blast, a deafening roar and a flash of blinding light. He grabbed a gun and dived to the floor. All the lights were out now. The generator hum had stopped. Then he looked up. The corner of the room was open to the sky. He could only see an outline of the shorn rafters through the cloud of smoke that was escaping. Where did the shell hit, he thought. Did it take out any of the men? The Germans looked safe. The cots in their corner were untouched. He began to crawl toward the oil stove. There was no sign of light from the stove. Was it incinerated in the blast? They would freeze soon without its heat. It's winter time, by the way. Deep winter. He could already feel some snow blowing through the hole in the roof. Blaze, he called out. Where are you? Is everyone safe? The two nurses cried out. Safe here, safe here. Some of the soldiers who could speak replied, safe here. One of them began sobbing. Bruce kept crawling till he touched a searing piece of iron. He pulled his hand back. It was from the stove. He turned to the left, nudged forward, and felt a body in his path. He found the radial artery. No pulse. There was blood all over the head and neck. A shard of stove metal had sliced the jugular and torn most of the face off the soldier. With a sense of doom, he slipped his hand into the man's back pocket. His fingertips traced the caduceus stamped on the wallet. It was a twin of the one in his pocket. Just a month ago, a soldier who had been a shoemaker made them the wallets for Christmas. He put his head on Blaze's chest. No heart sounds, no breath. A good life was over. So I was trying to capture some of the kind of action that a physician might have seen in World War II that people now would probably not not think a doc would would experience those kind of things. But um, our main character, Bruce, going through that and many other things does come back to the United States with some emotional wounds, not only from the war, but from terrible rejection from a woman that he fell madly in love with while he was stationed in England. Uh, that's another part of the story. We think of things sometimes we think of, uh, 
oh, the nobility. I mean, there's a reason why World War II is used a lot, I think, in movies and things, is there's a clear villain, right? We can all hate on Nazis. That's very, we think of it as very clear cut. Um, and and it, for whatever it is, we are sending people into those situations. We don't think about that in detail. And when you lay it out like that, it's like, wow, you know, you think of, of a person going through that, a person witnessing. And at the same time, there's that that perspective that, you put in there of the doctor, the trying to help. I'm here to help. I'm here to put people back together while everyone else is trying to tear them apart. We tend to see these wars from a from a great distance unless you're right in the midst of it, like this character was, or the people that I talked to after Vietnam, or I'm sure my father and my uncle were. Uh, those of us that haven't served on the front line, I've not served on the front line in battle, it may tend to sometimes romanticize it or even um, dehumanizing of what might happen and not being fully aware of the human toll. The pictures we're seeing now from Ukraine, from the front page of the, I, we get the New York Times every day and the front page almost every day just has these heart-rending images. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, there was an image of a soldier, I think he was 21, and he was looking in the coffin and had his hand on his twin brother who died. It's, 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 there's tough stuff happening out there. Did you? I was curious about some of the research that you do, and and maybe what? How did you uh, relate to the balance between writing with a full knowledge of a modern knowledge of PTSD, intimate modern knowledge and research that you have at your fingertips and in your brain already, and then balancing that with with how would people think and talk about it, their vocabulary back then? Was that was that a difficult balance or not? Uh. Not so much. It's interesting that I thought uh, when I was writing, I could almost, I was almost in the era. It's strange. They're very different than medical writing. You know, medical writing, I'm checking all the references. Um, fiction writing, you can really get, go with the flow, if you will. So that, that you know, characterized the way this thing spun out. It's interesting because clinicians, people who do any kind of counseling or uh, any kind of therapy work, we trade in stories, right? I mean, essentially, that's what people are telling their story. Right. They're hoping for someone to have empathy for their experience and their story. Uh, now, the stories come to us from other people. And now, in this case, you're generating a story and you're uh, assembling the the pieces right. of that. And so, yeah, that's a very different experience that creates. Yes, I outlined the book. Uh, like a, a number of fiction writers that I've talked with, by the way, I had some teaching and coaching and how to write fiction before I did this and during it. Uh, but some of them outlined and I, and others don't, but as I, I guess my heritage as a, as a scientific writer, I needed some kind of structure. So I had had some idea where it was going, but once I got into it, it took some different paths than I hadn't really expected. Take. Yeah, I had someone on uh, a few weeks back, Ivan Infante, who was uh, talking about immigration and some of the things there as an immigration attorney, but also an, a crime novelist was talking about his approach to uh, just kind of, I think some people call it like a push method or just uh, basically pushing ahead in the story and trying to really let the story take you where it, it wants to go in it's a way. Of, and there's this kind of life of its own that the story takes is what a lot of people described. It sounds right. like you found that as well. Yes. I, I think it probably in a crime novel or a thriller, you have to be pretty careful to make sure all the pieces are fitting together. It's like a puzzle. You can't get it. You can't get into it. You can't get into the flow too much and forget about the character in chapter two that needs to be finished <laughs> off. Uh, brought back right. to life. Yeah. Yeah. Or some clue that was left out. But, but, <laughs> but uh stream to follow is not a, a mystery. It's right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, at its heart, it's in a way, it's a love story. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing is how that unfolds. I, a lot of times the issues of trauma are very connected, well, always, I should say, with the issue of relationships, any relationships, both with his patients, with his family. We have a reunion at the very beginning when he's coming home. And uh, I like how you, you, you in, the, in the story you draw out the fact that the war has taken such a toll on his whole family, everyone individually as right. and collectively. Even the ones that were at home. Yes. Had suffered in their own ways. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, the role that relationships play in the book, as far as how that interacts with the trauma. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that this uh, story needed to show how relationships could be harmed and they could be healing uh, as a way of uh, showing that emotional traumas um, 
can have their downsides, obviously, and also can lead to growth in a way. It might seem strange to hear about something traumatic being good for you, but in some people, it actually is because it gives them some impetus or drive to do things differently in their lives, Mm -hmm. uh, to commit themselves to certain causes, uh, to um, dig deep into who they are and what they want to be. The title, by the way, is metaphorical. It, it, I, I designed it as some as the idea being that part of the way to get over some emotional trauma is to find something that's very purposeful and meaningful, a direction to put your life into, and then to commit yourself to that. I, I was very, very much influenced by the work of Viktor Frankl, who wrote A Man's Search for a Meaning. Frankl was the survivor of Auschwitz, a psychiatrist that wrote this book in a few days after he got out of the camp. And it's rated by the Library of Congress, one of the 10 most influential books ever written. And if you boil it down to the essence, it's if you can find some meaning in life and then take some action to make that happen, that that's a relative antidote to even the worst despair. found that to be true when he was in Auschwitz. It's something Uh, that uh, comes up a lot when I talk to people particularly uh, when it comes to trauma and current as they're going through trauma, I, I've always uh, drawn heavily from his stories, Frankel's stories of almost mm-hmm. narrating what was going on with the belief and the investment that he was going to live to tell the tale, that he found mm-hmm. this purpose of I'm going to uh, be standing at a lectern telling everybody this happened to us yeah. and it should never happen again. He, he talks about a number of ways to find meaning and purpose and do something about it. One of them is through love and loving. Uh, so you asked about relationships and indeed uh, trying to rekindle and overcome in a very traumatic relationship is a central part of this story. Also facing some serious adversity, which is what Frankel found during the concentration camp experience, is a, a way to find meaning and purpose. So you'll find that in this book, Bruce has not only the adversity he suffered in the war, but more adversities. When he comes back to the United States, there's another battle that takes place with uh, a, 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 some people that run a silica plant where the, the townspeople work there. It's one of the main industries. And it's, uh, if you've heard anything about silica, silica it's, a, it's, a, it's in almost worse than the black lung disease. Wow. Uh, these little spicules of silica get down in your lungs and get stuck down there. They're microscopic and they cause fibrosis. And um, I happened to work in a plant that made silica or made products from silica when I was in college. So I knew a lot about it. And I saw men that were in their early fifties that were dying like flies wow. of uh, emphysema or, or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or fi- uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Mm-hmm. Wow. And uh, there's a big battle that takes place on that front too, back in the United States. So that gives Bruce um, a way a stream, one of the streams to give itself a challenge, a a purpose, a way to show determination to overcome things. And as part of that, then gradually he's, his trauma from the war begins to fade, but ultimately he has to learn how to talk about it and talk about it with someone who understands well enough to take that journey with him. It's a journey of healing when you talk about that. And you talk about the traumatization, and it sounds like also re-traumatization uh, that happens. They're the different forms of trauma that are there. And I think it's, it's once again, easy for us to wrap our mind around the idea that combat trauma, we get that, being shot at, having to take a life, having to witness these things. Um, but yet, you know, what we don't talk about a lot is that they've done studies of different forms of trauma. You mentioned like the relationship trauma being right up there on his list. I, right. One of the most fascinating things that I heard a while back was some studies that they've done on some of the markers of, of trauma, heart rate, and just monitoring. And anyway, they found that that veterans, and when they would study them going through it, as well as telling the stories, going through the red tape of bureaucracy to access healthcare for them and other other forms of red tape that they had to go through uh, triggered just the same levels in, in many people of trauma that they would experience on the battlefield in, in combat situations. And so there's lots of things that are traumatizing. And in this case, yeah, I was saying like, my patients are being hurt working here. How do I as a doctor react to that? That's a whole ethical yeah. 
struggle. I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up, Dwight, because one of the reasons I wrote this book is because trauma is almost universal. Almost all of us have had one form of trauma or the other. I mean, who lives and goes through life without some kind of nasty or horrible things happening to them? Medical illnesses, deaths, uh, injuries, car wrecks, sexual assault, uh, being abused as a child, uh, and innumerable things that can happen to us. And so I, even though this book does feature wartime trauma, I, I, I did try to weave lessons into it that I thought were universal wow. and were present, were, were good lessons for today. The imagery of the stream to follow too. He's also a fisherman, uh, which yeah. which is important for this too, right? <laughs> yeah. So there are streams in this, and some people ask, yeah. "Well, why don't they have fly fishing in this book?" And I suppose one obvious reason is I'm a fly fisherman myself. I love fly fishing, and I find it very uh, restorative. Uh, my times in the stream uh, can be usually beneficial to me. They're meditative, quiet times, times for thinking, times to regroup. Group, put things into perspective, and also be around natural beauty. Um, so th- that's one of the reasons I wrote it. But it turns out that activities like fly fishing can be beneficial for illnesses like PTSD. And there's veterans hospitals now that have programs that take vets who experience PTSD and who've never done, done fly fishing to take them out on the stream. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, and uh, I always thought that it was a pretty good tale to tell about some of the things that happen on a fly on a trout stream. Well, there's so much uh, yeah, imagery there and there's motion and there's action. I mean, action is one of those things that breaks, especially in the, the short term coping with trauma action of any mm-hmm. kind, getting up, moving around um, as Chris Revel, who's a, who's a, another podcaster that's on this show quite a bit. Uh, he's kind of, kind of uses the phrase all the time. Action is a form of self care. Right. And exactly. So, yeah. Uh, and there is action. You're, there's movement. Uh, you know, there's there's, there's uh, some newer things on meditation, mindfulness, that suggest that uh, moving while you're meditating can be a very effective way of, of of using that very valuable method. And there's some folks that really can't do it very well just sitting in one spot and trying to meditate. A lot of people, yeah, I like find. me, That's I'm why one people of those. don't do it. <laughs> That's why yeah, it's yeah. one of the best research, most helpful mental health techniques that nobody likes to do, it seems like sometimes. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> if you've ever cast a fly rod, you know that there's a certain tug and rhythm to it. I'll do it here on the screen. That's <laughs> very uh, mindful, if you will. Yes. Yeah. And so there's that's woven in there. Now, they wouldn't use the term mindfulness back then, and, and they no. might not be into uh, uh, transcendental meditation either, I would imagine. Not at all. The whole. No. <laughs> it no. was probably 20 to 30 years before even what's the what's the big book? The relaxation response was written. Yes, yeah, Benson. Think, you know. that worked, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but uh, working those things in, once again, I guess there is a, a benefit then to having the modern perspective and looking back because you could work in the mindfulness without calling it that. And, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I worked, I worked in therapy. Um, the main character doesn't go to a psychiatrist. There weren't any psychiatrists to go to in his town. Yeah. Uh, and so he has to find his own way. And, and I, I think he finds things that we would say are quite therapeutic now hmm. um, a, along the way. And so there are some lessons in it about how one might um, do some things, you know, doctor, heal yourself. So yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bruce Duncan tried to work on healing himself. And um, I, I won't give away the twists and turns because there are some suspenseful things that happen, quite, quite a number of them. And you're never sure to the very end exactly how it's going to turn out. Uh, but I didn't want to write a tragedy. I'll, I'll yeah, give that. <laughs> people. Well, and this is the thing where trauma kills people, just like depression kills people, anxiety yeah, kills people. Yeah. And you even mm-hmm. mentioned the and and they're doing a lot lately of the studies of some of the physiological effects of that stress. You mentioned you feel like it may have cut your father's life short, uh, and and that yeah. there is a stress mm-hmm. that we carry around in the nervous system, just being activated in fight or flight, right, all the time. Yeah. Yes, very much so. There's another character we haven't talked about who's Bruce's brother, Glenn, who uh, was a fighter pilot. And uh, like my uncle, flew over the English Channel and had a 
very serious crash one day and burned himself, was burned very badly. And uh, Glenn uh, has huge struggles, uh, not only with with the PTSD, but with uh, bipolar illness, which there wasn't much known about that at that time either. And of course, mental illness, we still have suffering in silence and stigma and not talking about it, but it was rampant then. So uh, trying to deal with stigma and getting some help when you really needed it as part of that old, that story from this book too. Yeah. 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 And uh, at the time, were they even using manic depressive yet? Were they talking about that yet? Or was it just, you got a, the blues man? No, I think that, that, that the, the idea that there was manic depression was known in those days. Uh, nothing at, about how to treat it mm-hmm. other than um, electroshock therapy was used. Okay. Uh, they, they were very crude treatments. Um, even lithium had not been as, uh, de- developed at that time. There was, lithium was in the earth. And lithium is an element, but it had to be <laughs> right. Nobody was treatment taking bipolar that. disorder. Right. Yeah. yeah. And now I see a lot of people go to like a, a Lamictal or, or something like that first uh, before they try. Yeah, well, sure, with lith- lithium is... I, you know, I, I'm a long-standing psychiatrist. I'm the director of the yeah. depression center, the University of Louisville. So I see a lot of people with mood disorders, bipolar and unipolar, and we still use lithium. Lithium's a good drug. Yeah, there's some people, people take it still. Yeah, but if, if it works, it can be uh, just a tremendous yeah. thing. I see people with complete remissions that live their lives without any you know, ongoing uh, bipolar symptoms at all when they're on lithium. When you talk about, it's a great point you make that, uh, you know, he didn't have anyone to go to, right, at that time. And I, I would imagine that anybody who was feeling off in any way that they considered help with medical help at all, he'd be the, the guy, actually, they'd go to if he's the family practice right. guy. So yeah. now, physician, heal thyself kind of thing. You know, that leads into what do people do and what did they do back then to find comfort you know, I noticed when he gets home, there's a big party and it's like, hey, everyone's bringing alcohol. It seemed like there was a celebratory, comforting kind of thing of like, let's party or let's drinking obviously was a big one for people. <laughs> no, thank, thankfully, intoxicants aren't a problem anymore in our culture. Uh, no, <laughs> right, but, right. but obviously we go towards that. Some of those unhealthy as well as healthy comfort skills that, that people go for. Yeah, I think that uh, excessive alcohol during that era and still in our era is uh, one of the most common things that one does that often doesn't help. Uh, Depends upon how much and how much you can tolerate and how it works into your life. There's some people where, you know, a glass of wine or two helps them relax and it's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're drinking a pint of whiskey a day, that's you're in deep trouble and Mm -hmm. plan the brother does get into trouble with that yeah. quite severely in, in this book. Yeah. And um, not talking about it, just going on with your life, being grim about it, suffering. And uh, it comes out physiologically, mm-hmm. hypertension, smoking, smoking was rampant back then. And uh, there were many people that died of lung cancer that need to die of lung cancer or heart disease. Yeah, yeah, well, throw that on the silica factory employees, probably not very great. Right. <laughs> to amplify. Put the two of those together, plus stopping off every night for about six beers, uh, <laughs> you can see that your life expectancy was not, uh, yeah. it was not huge. Huh. You, know. you know, one of the things I think is very interesting about comfort and coping mechanisms that people adopt is that uh, I like to think of it as a big, huge spectrum. at the And let's say at the bottom are the most self-destructive, right? Uh, really unhealthy coping skills that can kill you and can kill you instantly, including suicide or some of those uh, uh, really, really drastically unhealthy. And we could probably talk about that and isolate. Here's what we think is the most unhealthy, right? Maybe that is suicide. Whatever. But if we go up the chain, healthier, 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 one of the things that's always been interesting to me is you couldn't actually say, here are the universal top five healthiest coping mechanisms. You couldn't say that really. There isn't one. There's no such thing as like, these are the healthiest for all people. Mm -hmm. And so therefore there's so much subjectivity and finding the right thing that ties in. And and nowadays, a lot of times you have maybe therapists and a a prescriber and a team even of people who can help you to sort of practice and process and brainstorm those things. 
Um, and, and interestingly enough, as you said, this was the time where it was like, I figured it out, I guess. And right. Yeah. That's a very good question. And what, what are the top five? I mean, could people actually identify them? Um, I'd probably think of a few, but uh, that they're so personal that, that, that they're different, different, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. So, um, you have to find your own way. Uh, Frankel certainly said that, that there are many ways to find meaning and purpose. If that's one of the ways of positive coping, that's a very deep way of positive coping, in my opinion. Yeah. There are other ways that are uh, uh, more practical, if you will, or more, no, I shouldn't use the word superficial, but um, getting deep into your sense of purpose is, is, a, is another level. Well, yeah, you know, hobbies have a really powerful impact. But then you're talking also about this concept that, uh, you know, I mean, self-care isn't just taking a bubble bath or going to a weekly tennis game or whatever it is that that's an enjoyment. It's also f- trying to find a sense of peace and purpose, right? And saying, like, right. I have some work yeah, to do and some play to do that, that are fulfilling to me. You, you wonder what gives a person a really profound sense of well-being in their life. Mm-hmm. And it may not always be the pleasure principle. Yeah. of doing what makes you feel happy at the moment. There may be doing some things that are pretty tough to do that take some sacrifice or, or a challenge or giving up some things that in the long run uh, give you that deep sense of well-being. Mm-hmm. There's a form of therapy called well-being therapy that I've gotten very interested in. And uh, they, we talk about two different kinds of well-being, there are many, many more than two, but one of them is this uh, sense of well-being through uh, meaning in life. And uh, that's something that I think we all need to keep in mind. And when I wrote the book, A Stream to Follow, I was thinking along that deep stream, in addition to streams that didn't run quite so deep. Mm-hmm. One of those might be, uh, for that for our character, was fly fishing. Another one was his, his daily work with his patients, which is extremely meaningful to him. Here I am going to put you on the spot, and so that it's nice that it's pre-recorded. So if I am putting you on the spot, we can edit it out. But I certainly hope what the plan is, as we get into this uh, this book club with listeners, is that we're going to have people have a chance to read. We're going to have a meeting like all book clubs do to discuss. And I'd love to invite you to be part of that, uh, to come in. I mean, that's one of the things that would be very exciting, I think, for for people reading it. I'd love to do that. That would be that would be really exciting. On my website, uh, you can find some questions that I s- suggested that book clubs might use. Uh, I think you already asked me a few of them, but there's some on that list that we haven't <laughs> talked about yet. Like, why did you write this book? Yeah. Do you yeah. Have- but- yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good. Um, what is your website, by the way, where people can find that? Uh, you can get it at uh, Just Right MD. Oh. At just Right MD. It's a dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Nice. Just Right MD dot com. Yeah. You got the dot com. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need to put that on. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'll put that in the show notes as well. So the way that we're going to do that, I'll let everybody know out there. You can uh, message me through a couple different ways. You can. Uh, Contact with me through Twitter, if that still exists, at Break a Brain um, on Twitter, if it, you know, by the time this airs, if it's still there. And you can uh, also go to uh, Facebook. There's the Broken Brain, just a group on Facebook. You can email me, Dwighthurst at gmail.com. Uh, the other way you can do it is you can go to our, our Patreon page. And on there, there obviously Patreon is designed to be a patron or a donor for the show, but I'm I'm setting up a uh, it's basically a free membership where you, it's essentially like signing up for a newsletter and the book club is going to be available to all listeners. You don't need to be a patron or a donor in order to be part of that. But if you sign up through there, you'll get the, uh, that'll flag you and put you on my list to, to give you emails about that. So, you know, when we're reading it, when we're going to meet, uh, we'll have a zoom session where we'll come on and talk about it and, and, uh, be able to delve into some of those things. Uh, Jess, is there a better place or a best place for you for people to buy the book? I mean, obviously, just we want them to get the book, but is uh, there one? Is there any marketplace that is better for? No, any o- any online uh, any online bookseller will have it. Uh, the major ones like Barnes and Noble and Amazon, and also some of the indie uh, booksellers, if you like to go that route. Yes, 
Yes, I know that um, we we had the uh, the owner and creator of uh, Books and Crannies. Uh, Deshaun Hairston was on a while ago on the show, and that's a hey, go to Books and Crannies. I'll have to go Google that and buy it from sure. her. But uh, yeah, to support, it's a good way to support independent local bookstores as well, and to help them because mm-hmm. they can get those things. So, well, thank you again, and looking forward to having more discussion about this in the future. Well, thank you, Dwight. It's been really a delight to talk with you. You're a very easy guy to converse with and uh, ask excellent questions. <laughs> so it's been it's been a the hour has gone by very quickly, and I, I hope that uh, we'll have a chance to talk again before too long. For sure. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.